Hey everybody, Mr. Campbell here. Um, this video goes with the first lecture in modern American history, 1865 to 2000, on the Reconstruction. I'm just going to touch on a few um, a few topics that I didn't go into in enough depth in the lecture for those of you who are on the uh, the honors course. First, I want to talk about uh, after the Civil War, the advent of segregation or Jim Crow. Jim Crow or Jim Crow laws is the, uh, the common term for laws segregating blacks from whites in society. Now we do know that segregation followed slavery, uh, but what might surprise you is that it didn't follow slavery immediately. And the, the reading that I have you doing for this week for the honors course is from C. Van Woodward's The Strange Career of Jim Crow. This is a fascinating book. I read it in about four days. If you really want to get an understanding of the legal and social background of segregation in the United States, um, this is an excellent read. But Woodward points out that segregation did not happen immediately after the end of the Civil War. It's not like the South lost its slaves and they immediately imposed segregation. Segregation came about in this country as the fruit of a decades-long period, um, uh, the, the fruit of a decades-long period of, of uh, kind of searching over what the role of the, the black uh, race in the South would be in relation to the, to the, the whites. And it, uh, it came about after a long period of racial integration. So um, he points out in the reading that in the South, the cities were always more integrated. Even in under slavery, you had, you had whites and slaves living in close quarters and close proximity in the Southern cities, um, places like New Orleans and Charleston and Atlanta and Savannah. Um, so the cities were always more integrated and the slave masters always disliked letting their slaves go to the cities because there was something about the cities that was called that the uh, it was called the free air of the cities or the slaves would get a whiff of freedom going to the city the anonymity that the city offered it's it's easier to disappear in a crowd when you're in the city than on some isolated rural plantation uh, so the slave owners disliked letting their slaves go to the city, but the cities were always more integrated. So there was integration in the South to begin with. But what's really interesting that Woodward points out is slavery presupposes that the races are going to live in close proximity, be simply because if you're going to have slaves, you need to be able to keep an eye on them. So under slavery, the, the blacks and the whites lived closer together than they did after slavery ended, after the Civil War when the, uh, the, the owner class no longer had obligations to the slaves uh, or to the former slaves, they could just kick them, turn them out, uh, send them away, and, um, and that's what they did. After the war, radical reconstruction was imposed by Congress. Now there was resistance to this, especially in the period from 1865 to 1870 associated with the first Ku Klux Klan and the Knights of White Camellia and these different groups that violently resisted um, black enfranchisement, black activity socially at the polls, uh, and, and also against whites uh, who were collaborating or northerners who were helping to, uh, to uh, register blacks to vote and whatnot. But from the 1870s on, after the first Klan was defeated around 1870, you find the South pretty much acquiescing to the fact of integration. Uh, to that blacks are going to be accepted on equal terms with whites. And you had blacks uh, elected to Congress serving on juries, uh, getting local jobs, uh, attaining judgeships, working in law enforcement, working in government. Um, it was a period of, um, uh, of relative integration. Um, uh, restaurants integrated, trains integrated. Um, the, uh, the book mentions a black man in the 1880s who rode a train car across the South with whites and didn't have any problems with it whatsoever. And this is because um, the, the white conservative class in the South had pretty much understood that, um, that they were powerless and if they wanted to have any say in the new order, they needed to court the votes of, of blacks to try to win the black vote back from the Republican Party. And so the, the white conservative aristocracy, the former slaveholding class, actually said, look, yeah, we fought against this, but this is the way things are going now. And um, the best thing we can do is try to win black votes. Of course, it was very pandering. It was very paternalistic. It was like, uh, it, it was very much like, um, you know, let your old 
let your old uh, masters still look after you. We know what's best for, for the black man. But uh, the point is there wasn't any segregation, uh, or I shouldn't say it wasn't rampant in those first decades. So throughout the, the 1870s and the 1880s in the South, you find relative integration and things seem to be going okay. Segregation would come later. Uh, the movement towards segregation would come in the late 1890s and reach its peak actually in the, the early 20th century, around 1910. And it's interesting because segregation in the South was pushed not by the Civil War generation, but by their children, those who were only kids during the war. Why? Well, uh, the North had pretty much abandoned the fight for civil rights uh, after the Compromise of, of 1877, where the North agreed to end Reconstruction um, if the South would recognize Rutherford B. Hayes as, as president. So the, the North pulled out of the South, and this enabled... Um, this enabled the old white power structure to reassert itself. Um, also, um, uh, also the collapse of the populist movement, which we talk about, I think, in another week or two. Um, the populist movement had briefly united whites and blacks in a common economic grievance against the moneyed powers of the East, but that fell apart, and so the white and black political union fell apart. Uh, also, you might want to mention... Um, the, the increasing move towards imperialism, things like the Spanish-American War, uh, as the United States spread overseas uh, into places like Cuba, the Philippines, and they needed the South support. And so, um, and so the North just kind of, because they needed Southern support to unify the country, they just kind of turned their back and winked at what was going on in the South, and the South reasserted itself. And there was just this increasing hostility towards blacks as the South felt ascendant again. And so all these segregation statutes start coming on the books between 18, mid-1890s and the early 1900s. And so this is going to lead to the proliferation of what are called the Jim Crow statutes, which are going to be the social and legal reality in the South from the early 20th century up until their final overthrow with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We didn't really go into a lot of detail about the Johnson impeachment in, uh, in the lecture, but so um, we mentioned that the, the radical Republicans had their own plan for Reconstruction. Lincoln had his own plan. Lincoln had always valued preserving the Union over the elimination of slavery. Lincoln had famously said, my goal is to save the Union. If I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would. Or if I could save the Union by freeing all slaves, I would. For Lincoln... Freeing the slaves was a means to an end. The radical Republicans, on the other hand, um, men like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, these are individuals who are motivated by a deep moral aversion to the institution of slavery. They are opposed to slavery the way that Catholics are opposed to abortion. It's an ideological, moral issue for them. And for the radical Republicans, uh, they are seeking really to punish the South and to forcefully integrate the, uh, the Negro into white society. Whereas Lincoln doesn't want to punish the South. He wants to return to national unity as quick as possible. So Lincoln is more lenient. Now Lincoln had a great moral authority as the president that led the country through the Civil War. Um, Congress had tried to pass a radical reconstruction bill, but Lincoln had, uh, had let it die and not, not signed it. But with Lincoln gone, his new vice president, Andrew Johnson, steps in. Johnson is a Tennessee Democrat who had been loyal to the Union. He had opposed secession, uh, was a, um, an ideological uh, follower of Lincoln in that he wanted leniency towards the South. Now, at first, the Congress thought maybe they could, they could work with him, but Johnson resisted all of Congress's measures to, to punish the South. He frequently tried to go around the, the Reconstruction Acts of Congress, tried to assert himself as commander-in-chief of the army to, um, to use the, the military governors of the South to, uh, to circumvent Congress, and really, really irritated Congress. Um, he even went on a speaking tour around the Midwest. He went on a stump tour by train, um, even calling some of the radical Republicans traitors and encouraging Americans to support him in his fight with Congress. This actually made him look really bad. People did not sympathize w with him. But uh, Congress was particularly concerned about um, 
about one of um, one of Johnson's cabinet members, which was uh, Edwin Stanton. Oh gosh, who, what was he the what was he the um, the minister of Edwin his cabinet member? Edwin Stanton was oh Secretary of War. Okay, thank goodness I have my phone. That's right, Secretary of War. Um, Stanton was a very ardent radical Republican, and the Congress was afraid that Johnson would try to remove him. So they passed a law called the Tenure of Office Act, and the Tenure of Office Act specifically forbid a president from dismissing any of his cabinet members without congressional approval. Uh, Johnson chose to ignore this and dismissed uh, Stanton anyway. I, the, this law was passed specifically to protect Stanton. Uh, however, Johnson dismissed him. Stanton refused to vacate his, his office. Uh, Johnson even sent a military uh, officer to Stanton's office to drag him out. He had to barricade himself in his office. But then the, the military officer ended up getting arrested for violating the Tenure of Office Act. And then uh, Congress put Johnson on trial for impeachment. Uh, for impeachment, you know, the president has to be to violating this Tenure of Office Act by trying to remove Edwin Stanton without congressional approval. There were several different articles of impeachment uh, against, uh, against Johnson. The one about Stanton was the major one. When, uh, when articles of impeachment were brought by the House, he was tried by the Senate, and the impeachment fell short by one vote. One vote only saved Johnson. And when they saw that the, uh, the major charge in the impeachment trial fell short of one vote, they dropped the rest of the charges. But it was okay. Uh, Johnson um, served out the rest of his term as a, a lame duck only for another year. He didn't get anything done. So that's the backstory behind the uh, impeachment trial of President Andrew Johnson. Well, there's really only one more issue I wanted to discuss, which is this really tricky question of the this idea about Southern heritage, uh, or I guess the question of the Confederate legacy today. This isn't a historical question proper, but more of a historiographical question. Uh, what do we make of the Confederacy today? Now, um, the Confederacy obviously lost the war, uh, lost hundreds of thousands of, of men killed and, and more wounded, uh, devastated their economy, turned their society upside down. Uh, immediately after the war, the South began attempting to digest or process what had happened to them and how to, how to rationalize it. And some decades after the war, due to, to popular memoirs and literature about the war written by former Confederates, you, you get the emergence of something called the Lost Cause narrative. And I'm going to talk about what the Lost Cause narrative is. But um, the Lost Cause narrative was... Um, was a way of sanitizing the Confederacy for post-war modern consumption. Uh, it was a way that Southerners could still celebrate their heritage uh, of the Confederacy without feeling guilty over the Confederate affiliation with slavery. It's essentially an attempt to disassociate the Confederacy from the institution of, uh, of slavery. And, and because of the Lost Cause narrative, this is like a way that Southerners uh, could proudly wave the Confederate flag uh, while simultaneously saying that it was not about racism, but about heritage instead. So the lost cause narrative essentially says that, look, it's inevitable that slavery was going to be abolished by the North uh, eventually. The North had superiority of men. Uh, the population of the North vastly outnumbered the South. They had superiority of, of resources. All the industry was in the North. Um, so it was inevitable that slavery as an institution was going to die out. And many in the South foresaw this, so the, the Lost Cause narrative says. But that's okay because it really, the war wasn't really about slavery anyways. <clears throat> it was about states' rights. It was about the rights of individual states standing up uh, for their own autonomy in the face of an out-of-control federal government. And it was about, in another sense, um, about taking a last stand for an older, slower way of life, an agriculturalism of the South versus the urbanism of the North. North. Uh, the idea of a chivalric aristocracy versus the cold bureaucracy. 
in the North. So it's like this idea that the, the Confederacy represented the last stand of Western chivalry, uh, gentility, aristocracy against the cold, modern, urbanized bureaucracy of the North. Uh, it, it's like the last stand in favor of a more wholesome way of life. And these are noble ideas that the South is, uh, that the Lost Cause narrative puts forward here. And because these are noble ideas, it's okay to fail then. It's okay to fail and to lose if you fail in the service of such a noble cause. A cause that is noble, but was destined to failure because you're fighting against the very development, the very progress of history itself. So it's this way of sanitizing the Confederacy. Now, historically, this argument fails for many reasons. Number one, uh, it was not inevitable that slavery was dying out. Uh, in fact, slavery was on the ascendancy everywhere in the decade before the Civil War. We know the, the Compromise of 1850 allowed the establishment of slavery north of the Missouri Compromise Line by popular sovereignty. The Dred Scott case said that a slave does not become free even if he travels in the north, which essentially implies the spread of slavery into the north. Like if you have slaves and you live in Alabama and you move to Minnesota and they're still slaves, I'm sorry, even if Minnesota is a free state, you now have slavery there. Um, the Fugitive Slave Act, which mandated that even Northerners and law enforcement in the North had to help uh, had to help slave catchers return escaped slaves. Slavery was on the ascendancy everywhere in the 1850s, <clears throat> so it's not inevitable that it was going to die out. Uh, secondly, the records of the secession plebiscites of 1861 tell us that secession of the South was absolutely unanimously about the preservation of slavery. Many of the secession councils held across the South specifically say we are seceding for the purpose of uh, defending the institution of slavery. Vice President Alexander Stevens of the Confederacy famously called, he said, slavery is the, the bedrock of the Confederacy. It is the rock upon which the Confederacy is built, making a perverse comparison to the Gospel of Matthew that the church is built upon St. Peter. And he says the Confederacy is built upon the rock, the foundation of, of slavery. So, um, and many other Confederate leaders said the same thing, that slavery was the reason for the secession. So you might ask when someone's waving a Confederate flag or, or, or you know, uh, something like that, what is the heritage they are honoring? Are they just honoring being Southern? Um, well, that's one thing. It's one thing to honor being Southern. I love being a Michigander and I can understand someone wanting to be Southern. But to be Southern is different than to be an adherent of the Confederacy. Uh, the secession of the South there's arguments to be made that the secession of the southern states was never supported by the majority of the population. It was carried by a small agricultural elite, just like the original American Revolution was pushed by a small elite group of, of merchants and lawyers and business people. Um, so don't equate the heritage of the South with the Confederate heritage. Uh, the Confederacy, there's no way to disentangle it from slavery, from the preservation of slavery. That's why it existed. And so it's my personal opinion uh, that at least in official government capacities, like I don't think state government houses should be fly flying Confederate flags or things like that. I can understand individuals wanting to fly the Confederate flag um, you know, on their own property, whatever. But as far as the public government honoring of the Confederacy, that's strange. Have you ever heard of any other country where there's a rebellion, like a revolution, uh, against that government's authority? And then after the war is over, the government honors the rebels by, <laughs> by still waving their flags at the state houses? Um, granted, I understand that people that don't, that wave the Confederate flag today don't mean to be racist or aren't racist. I totally understand that. But the fact is the historical legacy of the Confederacy is, uh, is bound up with, uh, with racism for sure. Um, and with slavery. Uh, but the lost cause narrative took hold. It really did because the North looked the other way after the war. I mean, the South was defeated, the South was devastated, the Union was saved. For the sake of unity, why not just let the South have their heroes? Um, 
Witness that to this day, the Southern generals, men like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, are much more appealing, popular, attractive figures than the Union generals, who are generally portrayed as bumblers or hampered by bureaucratic problems. Um, this is part of that lost cause narrative, the, the playing up of the romantic, chivalric elements of the South's legacy uh, and, uh, and really kind of it trying to downplay its connection with, with slavery. So that Southern heritage today, uh, the South has lots to be, lots to be proud of, uh, obviously. Southerners have a lot to be proud of. Um, slavery is not one of them, <laughs> and the Confederacy exists for the preservation of, of slavery. So um, I think that people that want to celebrate Southern heritage, it, it should be separated from the idea of celebrating the Confederacy. The Confederacy is interesting. It's an interesting topic of study, um, but it itself is not something to be celebrated. Anyhow, that's just some uh, my opinions on the, the lost cause narrative. I'm not just speaking because I'm a Yankee about it. I'm trying to be objective as a historian. But at any rate, um, just something to think about.